everyone welcome to defcon safe mode from crazy vegas parties last year to me sitting alone in my room right now and sipping vodka in 2020 wow it's been a crazy year but it's literally like vegas in my house right now because cocktails are acceptable at any hour and i have no idea what time of the day it is things have changed drastically in this time when everything is getting cancelled i'm so delighted that at least we still have defcon welcome to the new normal thanks for joining in before we start, we would like to add a disclaimer that all content over here is specifically for demonstration purpose and or everything is informative and we have performed all of it on demo environments. Now, before moving ahead, we would like to introduce ourselves. So just a little bit about us. My name is Devan Pan and I work as a security consultant with NCC Group. I have multiple areas of interest, but the most recent one being IoT and radio hacking. I have also contributed in the development of NICE, that is Non-Intrusive Confidence Engine for Multi-Factor Authentication Mechanism. And I am also working on Instant Messaging and Secret Storage Protocol. It is the first talk that I have ever given, and therefore, just a heads up to you guys, the talk would be pretty beginners friendly, and we'd go over a lot of basic topics as well. Now, passing on to my co-presenter. Thank you, Devan. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Shruti Lohani. I'm a computer scientist working in IoT research and development at Nexus in France. Um, I have three plus years of experience in IoT development for smart home, uh, autonomous vehicles, indoor outdoor geolocation, precisely. I have previously contributed to some international projects like uh, Electricity, and I'm also a part of Hall of Fame for my contribution to the development of end to end IoT platform for Eurocom. Uh, which is a leading research institute in Europe. I'm also an independent researcher and very passionate about IoT development, secure smart system teaching and women empowerment. Well, now moving on to the agenda for our talk today, we will begin with the idea of connected world and how it all started. It's like a brief, boring history, including introduction for our talk. Uh, well, it will be followed by the section discussing its security parameters. We will see how unaware we are surrounded with the billions of devices with some stats and then we will move to the section of attacks and exploitation scenario where we will be understanding a few basic concepts prior to our main demonstration. Uh, we will also cover some tools um, during this demonstration and later discuss the crucial points stating how we can protect our smart world from those discussed attacks, be it an organization, developer or project designer. Well, uh, lastly, we will go over the demonstration and we will demonstrate a small tool that we have developed which can be very useful in protecting IoT consumers or making them aware of any attacks they might be unknowingly facing on the connected world. Well, our connected world. Okay, so are you telling me that anyone on the internet can talk to my fridge? Mm -hmm. Well, today in an era of COVID-19 pandemic, we all are working from home aiming to stay connected worldwide during the time of social isolation, even including this talk, completely online, and where we are missing the real interaction with this crowd and nervousness in the presenters like us. Although we are really nervous, but thanks to Internet of Things, from wearable devices uh, and portable technologies to health-related accessories, IoT is everywhere. It has shifted from a futuristic concept to the central focus area of every industry ranging from manufacturing and retail to healthcare and real estate. But uh, the question is how exactly it all started. The Internet of Things emerged as the largest digital mega trend, bridging the physical and visual worlds with the fourth industrial revolution, or to say Industry 4.0. From the first revolution triggered by the construction of railways, we are now aiming for increasing the networking of people machines and objects over the internet. We understand that Internet of Things is basically a network of things which are simply any objects like devices, vehicles or embedded items in electronics with the only target of achieving connectivity to enable collection and exchange of data between the things to make our life simple. Showcasing its talent, IoT has facilitated things from eating our morning coffee to turning off the lights when we go to sleep at night. I swear to God, that thing has made me so lazy. Exactly. <laughs> this is the reason why dependability has been exponentially increasing, just like the COVID graph, from 1 million count to the expected 50.1 billion in 2020. There is a massive explosion in the usage of IoT devices. 
from smart homes, smart healthcare, smart city, and what not. We want everything to be smarter now. And this means, I literally have no idea how to even say this number right. But moving on to how, my, how safe my world is, uh, I'll pass on to you, Devang. All right. So what if I just tell you that the S in IoT actually stands for security? Yes, that is true. So uh, talking about how safe my world is, with billions of devices connecting the whole world, we care a lot about functioning, right? We want things to be done in just one click. We want things faster with less or almost no effort. Better the functioning soon be clicked to buy in Amazon, Alibaba, or wherever you guys shop. But we need to understand that there's a need for security on so many levels. So we should first look and compare the threat models in terms of classic web application and then in terms of IoT devices. Over here, we see a simple web app server connecting to a SQL database. Then we have a third-party web service and cloud storage. They all have their own corporate trust boundary and vendor trust boundary. And then we talk about the human user. The human user is actually directly in interacting with the web application. And then they all are being separated by separate privilege levels and their own trust boundary. So as you can see, definitely in no way I'm saying that web applications are extremely similar. Trust me, I would never say that. They can definitely and more certainly are more complex than the basic diagram which I'm showing here. However, we'll get more clarity when I try to compare it to a simple IoT implementation. All right, so in this next diagram, so as you can see over here in this IoT threat model, this is like a very simple IoT architecture. I have not even gone into more complex ones. We aren't even talking about embedded devices in airplanes and the complex architectures. We're literally talking about a very simple architecture here, specifically focusing only on smart and connected homes. I would say these are more of consumer IoT and less of enterprise IoT. So in this case, what we are looking at is a connected user. The, the user is so a connected user is basically a user who is interacting with their smart device. Then in this case, we have segregated the network into separate sections. So as you can see, we have a proximity network. So in a proximity network, we're considering to have a physical. So we basically consider a proximity network to have physical sensors, devices, and the IoT gateway itself. So basically, that would generally be in inside your house. Then devices are connected to the proximity network by, let's say, a smart ring which the user might wear, or any smart device which the user might have in their home. Then apart from that, the user also interacts with the mobile app. So a user basically has two avenues over here. One is in some cases to directly interact with the embedded sensor of their smartwatch or device, and then the another one is the mobile app or any web interface. Apart from that proximity network, we also talk about the cloud network. However, for IoT devices prior to going to cloud, we also have to consider edge servers, as that is what separates them from most of the classic web app. IoT's preferred microservices architecture compared to most monolithic standard apps. Edge servers decreases the overall latency and increases the device efficiency. However, it might add some more attack surfaces in the overall architecture. Let's just talk about a couple of attack scenarios over here now. So you can see that in a proximity network where the devices communicate over BLE, CoAP, LoRaWAN, as these are close range protocols and the devices are in proximity. Therefore, in proximity network, our main threat actors are generally the pre-installed malicious IoT devices as they might try to replay or intercept the existing traffic. They might also exfiltrate that traffic out through the IoT gateway. OK, now moving on to the mobile interface, we might have more attack surfaces, generally like, let's say, a malicious device, sorry, a malicious application on the user's device, which might try to in directly interact with the device file system and processes in order to extract sensitive user-specific data from the IoT device application. OK. So let me just come back to this. So the main was to show this threat model here is that generally when we consider IoT threat models, we tend to focus on external threat actors, like an attacker compromising third-party cloud services, or like a malicious app on the device, or like a malicious IoT device in the home ecosystem. So basically, when talking about IoT, these are the attack services we most care about. But 
What about the attack services that we least care about? What about those benign users on your home network who exist on your home network who also have updated operating systems, who have updated browser versions, and they're just casually running JavaScript? All right. So in terms of IoT devices, specifically for connected home devices, a common pattern has been noticed that the device manufacturers tend to give the least priority to device security on local area network. As the devices are not directly accessible to the external network, therefore, it is generally assumed to be secure without physical access. As in most cases, the designers just consider that physical access to be the only possible gateway to the private network. That is why these devices have a variety of open ports and unauthenticated HTTP interfaces running on them, which can be directly controlled by anyone who is present on the home network. The best example of this was Google Home's unauthenticated HTTP API, which was literally patched in 2019. And it gave anyone on the local network to perform multiple actions like rebooting the device or making any sort of modifications which a normal user could have. When talking about this particular attack surface, it is considered that if an attacker has physical access to the device, then the network-based attack is among the lowest concern. And physical, physical attacker access might open up some other serious concerns. So this one is given less, less priority. Sorry. However, what if this was not the only attack tree for the exploitation of these HTTP interfaces? All an attacker needs is a single public gateway to break into the private network. For a long time, home private networks have been pretty secure, as not everyone is running servers on their local host. L let's just be honest about that for a minute. Apart from developers and other people, not everybody is running or hosting an application on their local host networks. However, with the advent of IoT technology, IoT uh, has literally given an exponential rise to a variety of web interfaces running on users' private network. In most cases, the user is totally unaware of all the accessible IPs and even open ports on their devices. The question is, what if an attacker was able to proxy into the private network through a public gate? Now moving ahead to our next section, attacks and exfiltration scenario. We would first like you all to do a very simple exercise. I'd like you all to fire up your terminal and make a simple request. That is, perform this following NS lookup. Now, if it returns a local IP, then there is a very high chance that you might be vulnerable to something called DNS rewinding attacks. Now, look at what exactly the attack looks like. But for that, we need a quick refresher of how exactly DNS works. Well, we all know that a DNS is like an address directory of the internet. It translates the domain name like facebook.com, google.com to IP addresses. So browser can load internet resources. These IP addresses are given to each device on the internet and they are necessary to find appropriate internet device. It's like a um, street address is used for a particular home, you know, to find that particular home in that, in that particular location. So to understand how this translation is done, let us imagine a situation where a user is trying to access a website called shop underscore example.com because you know she's bored in this quarantine and one of to shop at least. So as a user types shop underscore example.com into a web browser, the query will traverse into the internet asking what is the IP address of shop underscore example.com and will be received by a DNS recursive resolver. Well, the next step is that if the recursive resolver has no answer, then the request would be passed on to the DNS root name server asking the same question at what is the IP address of shop and the square example.com. The root server will then respond with the address of a TLD. TLD is top level do domain server like .com or .net, which stores the information for its domain. In this case, it will be .com. Once the address of TLD is received, the resolver then makes a request to the .com TLD. The TLD server will behave like a root server. I know this guy who might know this guy and will respond with the IP address of the domain's name server. The recursive resolver then asks the domain name server, where is the shop on the square example.com? And then finally, the name server will return the IP address for shop on the square example.com to the resolver of the TTL. 
And lastly, the user's browser will have the requested IP address. Now the browser knows the address of the website. It is able to make the request for the shop underscore example.com asking for sale offer, for instance, where the web server on the receiving uh, the request will actually respond with that requested web page, you know, like we like 60% off. Wow, who doesn't like that? Well, we saw the complete flow to understand how DNS work instead of going through all this way and to improve the performance and reliability of data requests. This information is temporarily stored in the locations like browser, um, operating system, or recursive resolver. This is called DNS caching, and the set amount of time for storing is known as time to live, in short detail, as I said before. Well, let's take another situation into consideration. Okay. So I just from the previous slide, I'd just like to focus on one thing, time to live. Please make a note of it. It'll be useful later. So let's take another situation into consideration. Let's say that the user is trying to access some web page, and there are some annoying ads on the web page. Among those, there is one malicious ad waiting for the user's attention. Since this ad has to be loaded from another domain, our browser has to fetch it. But loading a random JavaScript from some random domain will give the attacker access to load anything in our browser and authority to make requests to maybe our bank.com or access pages for, let's say, maybe from our smartphone devices. But you know what? There is something called same origin policy, which is actually a policy implemented by the browsers and which let the browser restrict this kind of behavior as they restrict and limit any sort of HTTP request which originates from one domain to access resources that are hosted on or served on another domain. So to be specific, let's see an example. Okay, so let's take a quick look uh, at an example of how the same origin policy is able to protect resources from being accessed by malicious JavaScript running on websites across origins. So in this example, we have a secrets file that is secrets.txt, which is located at test instance running on port 8053 that is accessible over HTTP. And we will see how the same origin policy can protect this resource from being accessed by a malicious JavaScript running on a malicious origin. In this case, we are considering example.com to be that malicious origin. So when we try to perform an XHR request, so in the first example, it is of a totally different origin because hey, the host, that is example.com, as well as the port is totally different from the test instance. Okay, so here you can see that the browser's same origin policy was able to block the malicious website from accessing the resource as it said they do not have the same origin due to them having totally different host as well as port. Okay, now we'll be looking at a different example. So in this particular example, these two resources have the same host, that is testinstance.com, but they have they happen to have this uh, totally different port numbers. One, the secrets was actually on 8053, whereas this resource is on 8056. And we can observe that, okay, and in this case, when we try to perform a, a XML HTTP request, or basically a cross-site JavaScript fetch, we'll be able to see, okay. So as these two happen to have different port numbers, although they have the same host, uh, the resource is still not able to access the secrets.txt because the browser still considers this to be a totally different origin because of them having totally different ports. Now we will look at a standard example. This uh, page is testinstance.com and it has the same 8053 port as our secret. So this happened to match all the criteria that is required for the same origin, right? Then in that case, we'll just try to see that how exactly same origin policy would allow this one to access the secret. So in this case, as you can see, this was able to pass the same origin policy due to exactly the same host the same protocol as well as the same port number because of which it was able to access the resource which was hosted on secret which was actually located at secrets.txt so that basically sums up the example of same origin policy
So the question that arises here is, if SOP is actually preventing this kind of attack, then what is the threat? Well, DNS rebinding. DNS rebinding is a class of exploit in which the attacker initiates repeated DNS queries to a domain under their control. Consider the scenario where the user is comfortably surfing over the internet to access a web page containing some advertisement. Among those ads, there is one malicious ad, as Ivan stated before. As the web page is loaded, the browser will request the malicious DNS server querying the IP address of maliciousads.com. When receiving this request, the attacker control DNS server responds with the real IP, let's say 1.2.3.4 and it also sets the TTL value on the response to be zero minutes or few seconds so that the user's machine won't cache for long. Now, let's wait for some time. Now the malicious JavaScript makes another request to maliciousads.com and since the TTL is exceeded, the IP of maliciousads.com isn't found in the browser cache. Therefore, the browser will again request IP from the DNS server but what? Wait, this time on the user's subsequent DNS request, instead of the real IP, the maliciousads.com, the name server of um, you know, maliciousads.com, will respond with the IP of 10.0.0.1, which happens to be an IP within the user's local space and belongs to an IoT device on the user's network. The user's browser will receive this malicious DNS response and will use this provided IP to make the HTTP requests, which were intended for malicious ads.com. Because technically, there is no change for the browser according to the normal functioning. Because based on SOP, browser just sees the same name and goes, oh, we have the same name. So we are friends from now and allows all queries from the same origin, irrespective of the IPs. But the HTTP requests are now sent to the small, unprotected web server running on the user's local network. The same network where all your smart devices are connected and thus making your smart home unsafe. And that's behaving as a proxy between your private and public world. DNS rebinding attack can actually bypass network firewalls, security controls such as false and make every device on your local network vulnerable and available to an attacker from anywhere outside your protected internet. We understood theoretically, well, now it's time to hack. Okay, so in this example, the first thing that we'll be talking about is a router interface that allows anyone on the network to access the router controls once they have authenticated. However, even prior to the authentication, this allows users on the home network to access the home page to view a list of all the connected devices. So let's see how a user on this private network can become vulnerable to the entry binding attack by just navigating to a website that looks totally benign. In this case, cute videos, because you know what? Who does not like cute animals? So as you can see in the developer options uh, in the network request, you can see even before the page was loaded, the malicious JavaScript on the page initiated a port scan the local network in order to identify the router interface. Router is an easily identifiable target in most of the cases because standard IP of their default gateways and therefore it is easy to scan compared to other devices. So here it has already identified 10.0.0.2 and now automatically it has started sending the javascript on the page has already started sending multiple requests from the page to the external url and now this page is basically just waiting for the dns to be dns records to be updated so this video is already 11 minutes long and that's like already enough time for an attacker to perform the DNS rewinding attack so by the time the attacker so by the time you're even watching first or 20 seconds of the video, the attacker has already been able to rebind and has sent internal request to 10.0.0.2. And now we'll move to the attacker's panel. So over here you can see a WebSocket connection has been made based on which the attacker would be able to actually access things on the internal network. So now you can see the remote address has been updated from the attacker's IP address to the internal IP address. And based on that, the attacker is now able to any request that is being performed to the origin by the JavaScript is actually helping the attacker to communicate with the internal services that is running on your router. So now we'll just try some generic passwords. Oh, in this case, we just tried admin admin, and that definitely worked because 
a lot of routers, whether we want to accept it or not, are still working on default passwords. So this gives any attacker multiple functionalities like setting the functionality of the router, modifying passwords, and this also allows them to enable UPnP, which might make them vulnerable to multiple other vulnerabilities apart from this. It also allows the attacker to remotely reset or reboot the device. Also, it gives an attacker full functionality to like modify your DNS servers and thus serving you all the malicious websites that they want to. Also, they can just proxy your entire network and that would help them to take over other malicious devices as uh, other multiple devices on your network as well. So that would be in short pretty bad. And over here, as you can see, all those requests, so in this case, password update page that was being fetched by the attackers. So all these requests were actually being made to the external attacker's origin. However, the remote address was routed to 10.0.0.2 which was the router's IP. So by the time you're busy watching the cute dog, your entire router and the network has been taken over. All right, so for the second demonstration, we will be looking at a baby monitor. So based on the router's exploitation, the attacker already got to know more information about what all other devices exist on the local network. In this case, the attacker was able to identify there's a baby monitor running on 10.0.0.182. So for our demonstration purpose, there is a baby monitor and there is the baby Groot. Just to show you it's live, there you go. So this baby monitor software had a couple of functionalities, like it can connect to multiple other cameras on the same network, and this feed is accessible to anyone on the local network. So you can select all of the cameras. As you can see, there are three cameras here. Apart from that, it has functionalities to send commands to different cameras, like getting images, and it also has options of privacy toggle. Then you can see camera 3 is disabled, so it also gives an option to specifically put an IP and find the camera if in case it is disabled. Moving on to the attack, we will be using the tool Singularity. We will put in the IP, the port, and then we will be going for <coughs> hook and control because we actually want to watch the video, right? and the time interval is set to seven seconds and we start the attack. Let's look at the developer console. So this way we can see that every seven seconds a request is being sent and it is waiting for a DNS update. And there you go, as the DNS update was made, in, the, in this case, let's move on to the attacker's window. Here you can see that the attacker, there you go. So the attacker is actually able to get a live feed, right? Also the attacker can try to now perform mm, queries and in order to identify what all other IPs might be there on the network. So this would be really helpful for an attacker. So the attacker can also try to exploit things like maybe a command injection, which is definitely the case over here. So we'll just try to perform a curl request from the, the camera's interface to an external webhook that the attacker controls in order to see if we'll be able to extract more information by performing cat as well um, in order to extract fi sensitive files and also to perform curl to the external endpoint of the attacker which would be like very helpful in order to uh, set up a connection so that the attacker can then use the camera more like a bot so over here you can see that the ping request was successful then the information was also extracted and here you can see that there was an incoming request to the attacker's webhook from the baby monitor itself. As you can see over here, the request is coming from group. So this basically shows that, okay, the attacker's command, the curl command which the attacker executed was successful. So now the attacker can actually exfiltrate a lot of information by exploiting you know, the command execution vulnerability. So that's how basically like attacker can exploit it in this particular case. So for the third demonstration, we'll be looking at a smart home panel. So this is not at all a hypothetical scenario. This is something which we have seen very commonly. So this device is actually a smart home panel, which is kept unauthenticated because it is supposed to be accessible only on a local area network. And it is supposed to be placed inside of a tablet. And then it can be behave more like a control panel 
that it can access all these functionalities as you can see over here the lights thermostats and everything from a single control panel so that is why these kind of devices are like pretty common on a local area network and they are generally kept authenticated talking about a rebind attack on this particular device will be again using the tool called singularity and in this case we'll be doing hook and control so let's so over here we can see once the dns has been updated to 10.0.0.211 that is the uh, ip of the smart panel in this case then all the requests from the attacker's domain will actually be made to the result ip of the smart home panel on the port 8081 and that would basically allow an attacker to establish the WebSocket connection. So as you can see over here, the DNS rebinding attack is successful. So now you can look at the attacker's panel. So the attacker over here is able to take a direct control of the smart home panel remotely. And now attacker can literally set it to night mode, day mode. And over here, the attacker also has the ability to enable or disable the alarms. So now for this application, we explicitly specified and uh, disabled host check and made it vulnerable just for the demonstration purpose. But if we could just make that minor tweak in the configuration and enable host header validation. So you can see we have enabled it and now we'll be uh, reconfiguring the application. So now in this case, let's try to again perform the same attack after enabling host header validation. So we are going to perform the exact same attack on the application let's see what exactly happens this time so over here the attack is probably again going to say that it was successful so you can see it shows that it was successful moving on to the attacker's window let's see how exactly host header would prevent so when it is tried to access the attacker is presented a screen showing invalid host header because there was a clear mismatch between the host headers so this was actually prevented by the application's built-in host header validation okay so uh, we have already seen that how someone can actually exploit this but now the main question that is okay this attack is already known right so why does it still exist so let's just talk about what are the main reasons because of which it is still there so IoT devices, one of the main reasons is IoT devices are available at cheap prices with almost less or no security because there has been an explosion of very cheap and smart devices and vendors who focus more on adding functionality compared to security measures. They do not undergo thorough pen testing or any security compliance check at all. We see a smart device providing such a smart feature at low cost. We add it to our cart and purchase us right away. We as a customer do not understand that the cheap cost also comes out of price that is paid by the lack of research, development, and security measures. Moreover, DNS rebinding bugs have a history of being dismissed by developers and product designers, and many times it is left as an unaddressed issue because many of them are not aware of this threat. Apart from this, any specific mitigation for removal might go against the traditional procedure of DNS functioning, or sometimes it might break a lot of legacy applications okay so the next question that we ask is what individuals and organizations can do so some of the common ways an individual or organization can prevent such kind of things would be to the isp should actually consider configure their dns servers in a way that would block dns responses which contain local ip addresses additionally the device passwords should be changed and the firmware should be updated so this is something very specific for individuals like they should not keep their device passwords as default because as we already shown showed in the demo how a router was exploited was mostly because of default passwords being used also one of the good things that an organization should do would be to make developers more aware of such threat vectors as well there should be they should perform extensive penetration testing of devices before rolling them out also investing in threat modeling to identify such issues in the initial stages would be a great effort 
additionally internal network segmentation. So basically, for anyone who is actually trying to have IoT devices on their network, they should have multiple routes in internal network categorized for IoT devices. Now we move on to roles of developers and pen testers. So talking about developer and pen tester roles, pen testers, it would be great to actually know about this attack and to perform this kind of attack in almost all their type theming instances because this is a type of attack which would actually help them to bypass the firewall restrictions, bypass SOP, and still being able to get into a private network and then pivot to other devices. Apart from that, for developers, we would suggest host header validation is one of the most efficient ways of handling an attack like this. Also, the developers should make sure that they provide proper authentication for all the local services. Additionally, Instead of creating standard default passwords, all passwords should be uniquely generated. That would actually prevent a lot of vulnerabilities related to the industry mining attacks. Well, we saw how host header validation could prevent such attacks and the roles of organization, individuals, and developers in the prevention of the industry mining attack scenarios. But what about us? Exactly. We have created a browser extension called Security which intends to detect such attacks and keep a user safe while browsing such malicious websites. So let's see what we have with this tool. Security is a simple extension tool that monitors malicious behavior of domains which intend to scan the consumer's local network for internal IPs and port scans. Our extension provides a list of ports and IP addresses scanned by any host and also notifies the consumer if it detects any remaining attack or if any website scans your private network. But the question is, does it prevent rebinding attacks? Yes. Once the attack is detected, the extension will automatically block the further request from the requested URL, thus preventing the attacker from using the consumer browser as a proxy for further intervention. Moreover, in this extension, we have integrated the Shodan API, which helps us in identifying the information like IP and hosting for the possible malicious domains and perform a port scan on the attacker's domain. We have also provided an option of uh, manually blocking all HTTP requests based on user provide URL patterns. We can simply use the block list feature of this tool, which will prevent such sites from scanning your local network or to perform a DNS rebind attack. However, while working from home and testing this code, we observe that there are some instances where we do not want to flag a domain as potentially malicious, specifically in cases where I'm working on a VPN, and therefore the extension keeps on flagging all internal IP requests as a potential attack. So for that, we have also created and allowed us to bypass monitoring. Let's now talk about how this extension works precisely. So, uh, how the extension is identifying internal access scans. The DNS IP translations are done through the Chrome's web request API. The request object and the target IP is fetched and checked for the private scanning conditions. The extension notifies whenever the case occurs on scanning private IPs and on-click displays the details from the taken from the data object. How is it identifying rebinding attacks? Similarly, utilizing the web request API, the detect rebinding functions take that IP and origin domain name data to process for detecting if rebinding occurs or not, for which it first validates against a set of regex com compliant to RFC 1918 and compares against the target hostname. It validates if the hostname resolves to a private IP and if hostname is itself, itself not a private IP. When found true, uh, for these all sorts of conditions, it then flags the rewinding as true and notifies the user with details displayed in the table on click. Let's see how it is blocking the HTTP. So in our extensions block functionality, uh, we first check the valid input from the user for the domain name and then provide this valid pattern or URL to the Chrome's web request block request function in order to prevent fetching this particular hosting. Post permissions and content script matching are based on a set of URLs defined by match patterns, which permits a variety of schemes like HTTP, HTTPS, file, or FTP, and also the wildcard characters. But how are we using Shodan API for host info? 
we are using uh, the standard Shodan API to fetch details about the malicious host. The API is used to resolve the hosting to the corresponding IP address, which then is used to perform Shodan host lookup for fetching open ports and any other information that Shodan has about the malicious host. Okay, so let's see how the allow list is implemented. Similar to block list, we used match patterns for generating the allow list based on the user input. And then that is compared against the set of scanned private IPs to not flag them as potentially malicious, therefore preventing notifications and hostname blocking. Now, coming to the major feature of our extension, uh, that is how secure IoT is preventing the DNS rebinding attack, in addition to notifying all the aforementioned features. So once the rebinding is detected from the detect rebinding function, the block rebind function blocks the further request made by the attacker's request URL on the internal IP addresses, thus automatically preventing the attack and detect filtration. Let's uh, now we can move to the demonstration and see how the tool works. We are still working on this tool and aim to add features like sending monitoring updates to the users using mobile device and other smart assistant devices on the home network. We also plan to further improve and add support for other browsers like Firefox and of course some beauty filters because we understand that user experience should be convenient. So now moving on, uh, let us see the implementation. So uh, here is the extension. We will uh, now just try to scan. As you can see, it will display scan results, and you can now see the list of details of the scanner's domain, IP, port, and uh, timestamp. Apart, like we can use uh, the search for specific needs, like certain port number or a specific IP. Apart from the scan, uh, we have other features. Like this one, where we can see the information about the host, what ports are open, location, etc. Okay, uh, let us now see the rebinding uh, detection feature. For that, we will now execute a uh, rebinding attack and see if our tool is able to function as discussed before. So, we will do a simple fetch and get. We need to wait for a little, won't be long. And once we are done, we can see the details displayed in our tools. Okay, so we can see the refining attack is successful. Uh, also, our tool has notified us. And it's time to check the details. So here we can see the details, the affected IP, domain, timestamp. Moving on to uh, other features. Let us see how our block and allow list work. So we will go to the block or allow section and add the pattern we want to block from loading. We can test it with say rewind.it. And save. Now we will go to the rewind.it page. We were using a reloaded white work. So the rewind is blocked. We can take another example, let's say blogger.com. We will add this one as well and uh, try to block it. And hit the save to see if it is blocked or not. Now you go back and reload the page for the blogger. And it is blocked. We can also test this case for uh, iframes also, much relatable to the example of the malicious ad that we have seen before. So you can see that it is blocked by the extension and this will prevent any such sites from loading any malicious scripts. Now moving on to the allow list feature where we can specifically tell the extension that it should not flag any request from this domain. And we are doing it for uh, rewind.it. So we will type rebind so it here and save to allow it. Okay, so let's reload the rebind on page and scan again. And we can see that it does not notify as it lets the rebind scan. For that, we can see that we have no details, nothing. So 
Now we can scan from some other side to see if the functioning is normal. So let's check here. It will scan and notify us with a display of details. Let's see if it works exactly. So this is it. And you can see the details here. Okay, now we will be seeing how the extension is preventing attacks. So as you can see, this is the router which is hosted here. Now we'll be trying to perform uh, a hook and control in the rewind.a and see how it is preventing. So let's inspect and start back. We can see here all the requests while doing the rewind attack. Okay, so we can see there was successful socket connection and our extension is able to detect the DNS rewinding. But uh, the next thing the extension did is to block this, you uh, know, uh, it blocked the URL. So let's check. So for that, uh, let us go to the attacker's panel and uh, we can see what exactly happened. So here, the attacker will try to load the panel and you can check if it, he is able to load actually or not. So he's trying to fetch the page and we can see in the inspect that the extension is blocking all further requests to the page. So all the requests are getting rejected by extension. Therefore, we can see that even though the attacker is trying to fetch the information, that he won't be able to. And we'll just keep on waiting. So that basically concludes our talk. Uh, we'll soon be launching the code for Secure IoT on our GitHub after some modifications and bug fixes. And that's it. So thanks a lot for making it till the end. And stay safe.